Welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 98th episode of The Simple Sophisticate. Good morning and welcome to April. We've been in it for a while, but my goodness, it has been a beautiful month here in Bend. And as I tape this, um, Norman is in the room with me. So if you hear a little bit of snoring, he is immersed in blissful slumber. We went on a wonderful morning walk this morning and I can't express enough how lovely it was. It was quiet. The sun was shining. The boys were happy. Few people on the trail. And as some of you who follow me on Instagram know, Norman was happy and now he's exhausted. <laughs> so anyway, I'll be sharing one more picture of that walk um, later today. Um, so be sure. And maybe by the time you're listening to this, it's already up. So be sure to check out um, the Simply Luxurious Life on Instagram. But about today's episode, we are going to be talking about speech, and it's all about how we speak just as much as what we choose to say. So today's episode is titled The Power of the Spoken Word, and I'll be sharing nine ways you can improve your speaking prowess. As well, this week's Petit Pleasure is a book that, well, I knew I'd like it. I have fallen in love with it. It is my reading before bed material because as much as I thought it was going to be a cookbook, it's not. It's so much more. And so many of readers and followers have shared what they love about this book. And so I just wanted to open the doors to anyone who doesn't know about it. It just came out last year and it is absolutely lovely. If you're a Francophile, you're definitely going to wait to the end of the episode to find out what it is. And if you're someone who just loves to be in the kitchen, loves to work out in the yard, get those fresh vegetables from your garden, or, or simply someone who goes to the farmer's market, stay tuned. It is worth the wait. In fact, I cannot wait to reread a few passages as I go to the market later today to pick up some produce. Not the farmer's market, but the grocery market still. Farmer's market two months away, but still I'm getting excited. All right, but let's get to today's topic at hand. The power of the spoken word. I want to begin with a quote from F. Scott Fitzgerald. Here we go. Speech is an arrangement of notes that will never be played again. More often than we realize, it is the melody of how we say the words we express that have the most powerful effect. Yes, it is the words as well, the content. We cannot state a soothing sentence that contains hurtful, aggressive words, but as well, it's also the words and how they are spoken that plays a pivotal role in the connections we make, the influence we have, and the trust we build with our audience, whether professional or personal. Let me just read off a few names to you for a second. Some you may recognize and some you may not. Sam Elliott, Morgan Freeman, Sean Connery, Tom Selleck, James Earl Jones, Barry White. The deep, resonant voices of each of these men undoubtedly assist, assisted in their careers. Absolutely. I mean, how I, I you say Sam Elliott, I guess I can see him in my mind's eye, but I can also hear his voice. Same with Tom Selleck. Many of their roles solely required their voice and nothing else. Remember this? Words out. The taste you love is also a good source of things you need, like iron, zinc, protein, and some B vitamins. Beef, it's what's for dinner tonight. 
with its unforgettable classic music from composer Aaron Copland's Rodeo Suite. It is, however, the voice spoken as ruggedly and as maskingly as if actor, first it was Robert Mitchum, and then the, in the one you heard, Sam Elliott, it was as if they're almost taking troops to battle, not merely suggesting a protein for dinner that speaks to the future beef consumer. The power of a voice is almost hard to describe. However, it's interesting to note that if a man's deep voice hangs in your memory years later, you're not alone. Researchers at the University of Aberdeen found that women are more likely to remember a man if his voice is deep and low. Why? Evolution, they say. While it may have been drilled into women that deeper means stronger or fertile, in today's 21st century, simply because a man speaks deeply simply means he's speaking deeply. We, on the other hand, must do our homework to prove the assumption that he is worthy of leadership, strength, and the dependability that we may spontaneously want to give them right off the bat when we hear their voice, even though it may not be warranted. Frank Underwood, anyone? (laughs) Definitely take your time after you hear that deep voice that you become drawn to. However, understanding the power of one's voice is important to note because there is something to be said for that. Use that information, know that people are drawn to it and recognize that, oh, am I, is the first impression, my voice, what people hear, is it engaging them or is it making me more standoffish? It doesn't mean that you deserve someone to be feeling standoffish. It's just to be aware of what people respond to. Because it's the first sound associated with who you are. Granted, looks play a significant role as well. But the speech, how we speak, is the beginning of the journey of understanding who someone else is. Intelligent, confident, prepared, or stressed, unreliable. There's so many different assumptions that are made when someone hears how we speak. And while what is actually said can at times, as we know, undoubtedly be a red herring disguising what someone is truly thinking or truly capable of doing, we as the observer must determine if we want to proceed further. We need to determine, number one, yeah, they may be speaking this way, but what did they just tell me? And even if they do tell you something you want to hear, do your due diligence. Find out if indeed they also are someone that is going to follow through. So there's so many different pieces of the puzzle. The first one is how they speak. The second is what they say. And the third and the most important is the follow through. But how we speak is very, very powerful. Take someone who is beginning to learn a new language. Speaking from my own experience, one of the most humbling tasks as someone who loves the written word English word in this case, is speaking in a foreign language and not doing well. Why? It's hard to speak confidently when you aren't sure of how to speak correctly. And the energy that you exude is thus one of uncertainty. And that energy is felt by the people you're speaking with or the people that you're around. On top of that, if your vocabulary is limited, you are unable to be precise, clear, and pointed in your discussions, which further limits the connections that you're able to make. So yes, how you speak, both in the sound and the words you utter, does indeed matter. It matters significantly. And the good news is, just as you improve your second, third, or fourth language of choice, you can also improve in your native tongue. And that's what we're going to talk about. I have nine ways on how to improve your speech. Let's get started. Number one is to speak slowly. As I mentioned in episode 95, The Power of Presence, how we speak plays a powerful role in the presence we hold in a room or with an individual or a group. Speaking slowly exudes confidence that what we are saying should be listened to. And it also indicates that we shouldn't be interrupted because we've chosen to speak so sparingly, but only when something is worthwhile and should be shared. Therefore, the attention is assumed that it should be given to you. Again, much of this is about perception. But if indeed you have something to say, gather your composure and maintain it as you speak slowly and steadily. 
So number one is speak slowly. Number two is to eliminate the apology. Last year in the New York Times, an article was shared about the excessive amount of apologizing that women engage in both consciously and unconsciously. And then directly, the author did, without apologizing, implore women to stop doing this. I'll include a link to this article. It is absolutely worth reading because we are not even aware sometimes that we're doing it. Most of the time, we're not even aware. I catch myself every once in a while and I have to say, why am I apologizing? It doesn't even make sense. It's just becoming a habit that's ingrained, that is not condemned by society. It's it's allowed and so it's perpetuated. We see it modeled and then we model, we model that behavior. Now, she dives into in the article, why are we doing this? To put it succinctly, she states, we should use the words we put out into the world to embody what we really mean. Be declarative, tactful, and accurate, and refrain from being passive. We can still be polite, respectful, and elegant, but we no longer need to apologize for others' thoughtlessness or our reluctancy to speak up when we need to without apology. So number two is to eliminate the apology. Number three is to adjust your pitch and your tone. I want to begin with a quote from Adam Smith. Great ambition, the desire of real superiority of leading and directing, seems to be altogether peculiar to man, and speech is the great instrument of ambition. As mentioned at the top of the episode today, pitch is powerful. No, it is not indicative of the person's strength or abilities of whom is speaking, but there are assumptions and stereotypes that linger. Be aware of this reality. You can change to a degree your pitch. You actually can change your pitch to a degree. I just want to share an example of the fact that just because someone speaks in such a way doesn't necessarily indicate their capabilities. But I will also share in this example that the pitch made people assume the negative, which wasn't fair, but it was a natural instinct for many people. So here we go. I once had a female administrator who was more qualified, congenial, effective, and strict when necessary than her male counterparts. But when she opened her mouth, I did want to cringe. And many of the male staff had a visceral reaction of wincing as I looked around the room each time we had a meeting. And I share this example to demonstrate that one's voice is not accurate with regards to indicating someone's abilities. She, as well, was also an administrator that I had the opportunity and wanted to take advantage of this opportunity to write a letter of recommendation for when she sought a higher and much more deserved position. Gaining that position as a result of her qualifications, she was absolutely impressive. But initially, her avoid her voice was off-putting. Now, I am not saying people can change their voice drastically, but being aware of that, especially when it's the first time someone has introduced you, because for whatever reason, evolution, biology, the people we've been around, the experiences we've had with them, the assumption based on pitch is quite powerful and it stays in someone's memory. There's a study done by Duke University that they released in 2010 of both men and women who spoke in low, deep voices were perceived as strong, dominant, and healthy. And I'm going to share with you an example of Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. And you're going to first hear her voice before, so at the beginning of her political career, and then Quite quickly, you'll notice immediately the difference. It's going to be in the middle of her tenure as Britain's prime minister. So take a listen. Take a listen and see if you notice a difference. I've been so busy that I haven't had really much time to think about it. After all, I know I'm still only me and so do my family. But I'm very much aware of the responsibilities and a little bit apprehensive. Who wouldn't be? when you think of the names that I follow. Let me answer that very deeply because I feel very strongly about it. The greatest divisions this nation has ever seen were the conflicts of trade unions towards the end of a Labour government. The change in Margaret Thatcher's pitch is absolutely recognizable. But here's the catch. 
Here's the catch that many women find to be a double standard. It is that women are assumed to be more attractive when they don't speak in lower tones, while men can continue to remain attractive doing the same thing, low tones, deep voice. Now, if we look more closely at this assumption that the Duke University found, it has much more to do with traditional gender roles women subservient and docile and men strong, dominant and authoritative. And we associate that strong, dominant, authoritative with the voice in many ways. And as we know, we have been and are in the middle of a tremendous cultural shift with regards to roles for women and men and what's expected of, of the, of the balance of power in a relationship. If indeed a man wants a woman who is weak, he will probably still gravitate toward the high voice. But if someone is looking for a confident partner who is their equal, who they can trust, who is dependable, a lower pitch would certainly be more attractive. So I think we're also witnessing right in this 21st century a shift in that finding. So number three is adjust your pitch and your tone. Number four is choose water. Just as we need to hydrate our bodies for improved skin, hair, and to flush out the toxins, we also need to lubricate our vocal cords. And while drinking coffee, wine, or soda may be a craving, these liquids do not facilitate the hydration that our voice needs. Undoubtedly, this is why a glass of water is always on the podium or the round table when there are debates and discussions that are taking place on television or in conference halls around the country. So... When in doubt, choose water. Not only is it good for your health, but also the voice that expresses your authority, the respect you are commanding, and so on and so forth. So number four is choose water. All right, I'm going to take a quick one-minute intermission, and I'll return with five more ways to improve your speech. Welcome back. We have five more interesting ways to improve your speech. We're going to get right back into them. Number five is to eliminate the up talk. How you end a sentence indicates as much the content as well as the intent. If you end declarative sentences or statements with a high pitch of heightened intonation, your statement is presented instead as an interrogative sentence or a question, a wondering, not a fact, not a point of resolution. However, if you end your statement with a lower pitch, the door is not open for for questioning, for discussion. There is no wondering. There is no doubt. Granted, if you are indeed asking the question, a slightly higher pitch is understandable. But even then, how you ask the question can make a tremendous difference. Keep the end of your sentences low. When stating something factual or your opinion with reason, support, and confidence, and let go of the up talk. I will provide a link on today's show notes next to number five about the history of what one researcher believes is the origin of where all of this uptalk began. So number five is eliminate the uptalk. Number six is eliminate the filler words. One of the most difficult habits to break if we aren't conscious of it is you is to use filler wor- words or language such as like, a. Uh, er, um, and I'm sure you have your own if those aren't the ones or you've heard a few a few different ones out there. After bringing this challenge, so I, I become more and more aware of this. And after bringing the challenge up with my students each year when we are talking about the, the basics of speech and having them practice this and whether it's Socratic seminars or they actually are presenting a speech to class, 
I challenge my students to speak free of the filler words. And the first attempt will always erupt in laughter each year because often we are not aware of how much of a crutch such words have become in our everyday common language. My personal pet peeve is the word, guess it, like. (laughs) As a point of reference, if you listen or read formal conversation, news or newspapers, you will not see or hear the word like, even though it is frequently spoken in the everyday English language conversation. Why? Are we really comparing everything we say to something else? No, we're absolutely not. There are times when we do want to do that and then it's absolutely appropriate. But the valley girl phenomenon keeps holding on to us with her Velcro-like grip. We've got to stop this. I will admit readily, I still catch myself using this irksome word. But the more I notice it, the more practice I have of changing the habit. And as a result, I have gradually seen or heard my usage subside. So a challenge, eliminate those filler words. And a a lot of this really has to do with what we hear in our own, you know, circle of friends and where we work. If we hear it being used, we're more likely to mimic that. But if we're not hearing it being used, we won't be mimicking it as much, if at all, eventually. So that's the good news. All right. So number six is eliminate the filler words. Now we're going to move on. To number seven, project. Here's a quote from one of the aforementioned gentlemen with deep voices, James Earl Jones. Speech is a very important aspect of being human. A whisper doesn't cut it. Hmm. For men or women, even if you speak clearly, even if you speak slowly, If people cannot hear you, what you say is not going to stick. Yes, some people have a natural ability to project well, but all of us can improve. Much of how we're able to project if we're able to do it well has to do with our posture, whether we're breathing deeply from our abdomen, right as I'm saying this, I'm making sure I'm sitting up, (laughs) sitting up and taking a deep breath, clearing our throat and then choosing to speak confidently. The primary reason soft-spoken people do so is is uncertainty about how what they say will be received. While I hold on to Mark Twain's maxim, have more than you show and speak less than you know, when you do speak, speak up, speak with confidence and allow yourself to be heard. So number seven is to project. Number eight, smile. Even in times of trauma, warmth and comfort are a reassuring presence when observed in a speaker. As well, someone who is a joy to talk to often is smiling, not scowling. So when you speak, be aware of the visuals that have been seen or are being seen by your listeners. These details matter. So number eight is to smile. And last but not least, number nine, know your audience. Let me share a quote from William Penn. Speak properly and in as few words as you can, but always plainly, for the end of speech is not ostentation, but to be understood. One of the most fundamental aspects of speaking, in fact, it is one of the three points of Aristotle's rhetorical triangle, is knowing your audience. Even if you do speak slowly with a lower tone and refrain from up speaking, if you're speaking about or in such a way that your audience cannot relate, you will never be able to connect with them. So whether you are being interviewed for a promotion within your profession or speaking to an acquaintance who might be someone you are hoping to build a relationship with or a friendship with, note your diction, note the word choice, note your subject matter, and know and be aware of the items that should and should not be discussed. This finishing touch will show your awareness, your respect, and your knowledge of with whom you are speaking. And that, that alone is an act that is, while unspoken, exceedingly powerful. So number nine is know your audience. Even in a world, our modern world, where email and social media connection and communication has a ubiquitous presence in our everyday life and how we connect with people, it is precisely because of that reality, it is precisely because of technology's dominance, That our speech, when we do speak with others, whether it's on the phone, via Skype, or in person, 
has so much to value. And I would argue it has increased value because in those few moments, those immediate moments, you could say, when we first start to verbally communicate with someone, we either confirm or erase the impression we have built through previous forms of communication. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. It's a good reminder to each of us that no matter what language we speak, how we speak makes a tremendous difference on the connections we start to build. For today's show notes, visit the blog, the simply luxurious life.com backslash podcast 98 for all the articles I reference, as well as the videos and studies. And I've also included three articles from the archives about communication, how to be a better listener, mastering the art of communication and how to make connections. So be sure to stop by the show notes. All right. I'll be right back with this week's petite pleasure. You're not going to want to miss it. Welcome back. This week's Petit Pleasure is a book that just came out this past year, and it is written by Cook and author of 12 different books and cookbooks, Susan Herman Lomas. In her recent book titled In a French Kitchen, Tales and Traditions of Everyday Home Cooking in France, she not only shares with you 85 recipes from a handful of different French kitchens in even her own, but I have to say it takes you into the French culture. She is an expat who has lived in France for quite some time and is a professionally trained chef. As well, she offers a cooking school and you can sign up right on her website between $395 to $3,000 for a five-day cooking class that are all set in northern France in Louvier. This book takes you to France and takes you into the kitchens, takes you into the markets and how the food is taken care of and how it's prepared. So it's not your cookbook. It's not, it, like I said, it is a book that I have been enjoying reading prior to going to bed. It's taking me to France and walking me through the kitchens, teaching me how to clean the lettuce. She offers a list of essentials that you're going to want for your kitchen for supply lists. And it's not that lengthy and it's quite simple. Most of the things I already had in my kitchen, which I'm sure you probably do too. And so since we already have what we need, she then gives us the recipes and the ideas of how to approach the food that we have been drawn to as we're curious about this French culture. I have only read this one book by her, but she has 12 books out there, 12 cookbooks and memoirs. Her first memoir, which came out in 2001 to great review, has been recommended to me by many readers and it's already on my wish list. I cannot wait to read it. It is called En Rue Tatin, Living and Cooking in a French Town. Again, I highly recommend this book. As those of you who already follow me on Instagram know, this book arrived on Friday when I got home from work and I have devoured it all weekend. It is absolutely lovely. And I look forward to right now diving into her salads as spring has sprung and a fresh start is ready to begin. So I'll provide a link to her her book, her blog, her French cooking classes. And again, the book is titled In a French Kitchen by Susan Herman Loomis. Visit the blog, simplyluxuriouslife.com backslash podcast 98 for the links and all the show notes. I just know you're going to enjoy it. So happy reading and happy cooking. I hope you've enjoyed this week's Petit Pleasure, where each week ideas are shared to make the everyday all the more enjoyable. Tune in at the end of each Monday's podcast where I'll recommend a book, a film, a recipe, or from time to time introduce you to an expert who offers insight into how to live simply, luxuriously. Anything that is a simple pleasure to satiate your sophisticated taste. Thank you for tuning in to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. For more ideas and inspiration throughout the week, stop by the blog, the simplyluxuriouslife.com, or pick up the book, Choosing the Simply Luxurious Life, a Modern Woman's Guide. To stay caught up on the most recent podcasts, blog posts, and receive exclusive news and an extra dose of inspiration, which arrives each Friday morning to enjoy with a hot cup of tea or your morning coffee. 
just in time to jumpstart the weekend. Until next Monday, I'm your host, Shannon Abels. Bonjour.